Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, Merry Christmas to all of you here and also those of you who are uh, joining us online. You know, for most people, Christmas is a wonderful time of the year, uh, but it is also a very exhausting time of the year. My granddaughter just said, hi, Papa. So, <laughs> hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Uh, that's, I couldn't resist that. I was just, that's wonderful. But anyways, it's an exhausting time of the year, is it not? I mean, isn't it silly what we do to ourselves this time of the year? We, we cram about 80% of all the parties we'll attend all year and, and about uh, six months of calories into a three-week period of time. And um, one of the reasons that we're so exhausted is because all of the unhealthy food that we consume at this time of year... Um, now, I will admit there's been quite a bit of controversy going on in the medical world whether or not a high-fat diet is good for you or not. Uh, the Japanese, for example, eat very little fat, and yet they have fewer heart problems than the British, the Americans, and the Canadians. Now, that makes sense, until you realize that the French, they eat a lot of fat, and yet they too have fewer heart problems than the British, Americans and Canadians. Now we know the Italians and the Germans love their sausages and pasta, and yet they also have fewer heart problems than British, Americans, and Canadians. And so the final word is this, eat whatever you like. <laughs> Apparently what kills you is speaking English. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel which I preach to you, which you have received, and on which you have taken your stand. As we pointed out here, the Apostle Paul points out that one of the jobs that we pastors have is to remind us of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, why it is that he came. Because you see, the Christmas season means different things to different people, and, and I find there's just a lot of confusion these days about the true meaning of Christmas. And so I want to give the biblical account of the Christmas story. Now, right off the bat, it's important that I point out that the Christmas story doesn't begin where most of us think it begins. The Christmas story doesn't begin with Christ coming to earth. And all of the events surrounding that, including, you know, the angel coming to Mary, the angel coming to Joseph, the angels coming to the shepherds, and of course, Christ's birth uh, in Bethlehem. Now, that's all part of the Christmas story, of course, but it doesn't begin there. The Christmas story began a long time before Jesus came to earth as a baby in Bethlehem. The Christmas story is a love story that begins with God. The first verse of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before there was a beginning, God existed. God has always existed. He is the creator of the universe, and he sustains the universe, and he holds it all together. Now in Genesis 1.26, we learn a little more about the nature of God. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now notice God did not say, let me make man in my image. No, it says, let us make mankind in our image. God's referring to himself in the plural here as more than one person. This is referring to the three persons of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. You see, God never, has never been by himself. God has always been a community of three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit. These persons that we refer to as the Trinity have all the attributes of God in the sense that they're all powerful, they're all knowing, they're everywhere present, 
but they are totally one in every way. And if that's confusing to you, if you've got a hard time wrapping your mind around that, don't feel bad. We all do. And that's why God's God and we're not. For you see, 1 John, this is where the Christmas story begins. In 1 John 4.16 says that our God is love, which means his very nature is to love and to share his love. Our triune God exists in an unceasing state of perfect love, joy, and delight. You think of the times that that you've had with family or friends, your richest conversations. Or think of those special moments when you found yourself thinking, it doesn't get any better than this. That is but a small reflection of how much the Father, the Son, and Spirit enjoy each other. That is where Christmas begins. And that's important because it explains why he created us. God didn't create us because he was lonely or because he was bored or because he was looking for some cheap help to take care of the planet. No, as I just said, the Father, Son, and Spirit have a great relationship, the kind of relationship that we have all been looking for all our lives. It wasn't loneliness, but God's love that compelled him to want to expand the circle and to share the love that the Trinity was experiencing. God the Father, Son, and Spirit said, the love in the community that we share is so good, it is so rich, it is so beautiful. Let's create human beings and invite them in. So lest there be any doubt, God created you because he loves you. And he wants to cultivate a close friendship with you and also me. Now, when God created our first parents, Adam and Eve, he made them to live forever. The earth he created for them was a paradise. There there was no evil. There was no pain. There was no suffering. There was no death. It was a perfect community. Adam and Eve had an open, transparent relationship with God. And they also had an intimate, healthy relationship with each other. You know, someone has said, Adam and Eve had an ideal marriage. He didn't have to hear about all the men that she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about what a great cook his mom is. (laughs) Now, God could have ensured that the community he created stayed that way by programming Adam and Eve to obey his every command perfectly. But thankfully, God didn't want puppets. God wanted lovers. In other words, he wanted us to love him back freely in the same way that we want our spouses or our children or our good friends to love us freely from the heart rather than out of a sense of duty. However, in giving us the freedom to make choices, he risked the possibility of us spurring his love and going our own way. Well, in Genesis 3, we read that Adam and Eve did what we have all done since. And that is they, they, they took matters into their own hands. They turned their back on God. And in that moment, not only did evil and pain and suffering and natural disasters enter the cosmos, but the loving relationship that they we're enjoying with God and also with each other was fractured. In that moment, a fundamental shift occurred in the heart of mankind from wanting to please God and others to wanting to please self. Rather than being open and loving and giving, man, men and women became closed and insecure and selfish. The innocent, loving community that they were experiencing with each other and also with God imploded. They died spiritually that day, which means that they were now spiritually separated from God, leaving a spiritual vacuum in their lives, a vacuum that they've been trying to fill ever since. And consequently, we are born separated from God as well, not only because we are descendants of Adam and Eve, but also because we too have sinned and we've gone our own way. Now, this resulted in a serious problem. 
God's love wants nothing more than to bring us back in right relationship with himself. But God isn't just love. He's also a just God. And his justice demands that first our sins be paid for. This past week, someone in our family who will go unmentioned wasn't paying attention and bumped into the back of another vehicle. It was just a little bump, a $3,000 bump. <clears throat> the vehicle she hit, oops, did I say that? <clears throat> Let's rephrase that. <clears throat> the person whose vehicle was hit did not extend grace as we had hoped, but asked that the damage be paid for. Now, we understand that. We all have this innate sense of justice that says, if you break something of mine, then I expect you to pay for it. Well, in the same way, God's justice demands that our sins be paid for. The question is, how will our sins be paid for so that God's justice is satisfied? Well, unfortunately, most people try to pay for their sins themselves. This is the pathway of every religion outside of Christianity. Man trying to pay the debt of his sin through good works, through keeping religious rituals, of a certain pathway. And sadly, these people live with the ongoing burden of uncertainty and anxiety. For how do you ever know that you've done enough to meet God's requirements for justice. The reality is God knows we can't ever atone for our own sins. And so he did an amazing thing, an absolutely unbelievable, outrageous thing, when you think about it. He sent his son Jesus to earth to become a man. And then as a man, he paid for our sins by dying in our place on the cross. John 3, 16, probably the best known verse in the Bible, says, for God so loved the world. Folks, that's all of us. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, that is the heart of our lovesick heavenly father. He gave what was most precious to him to provide a way for us to come back in right relationship with him again. And friends, that is the fundamental reason why Jesus came. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. Because of his love for us, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, let go of the relational intimacy that he shared with the Father and the Spirit for all of eternity. And he put aside his divine power and he willingly became a helpless, dependent child learning how to walk, learning how to talk, going through all the motions and growth that we as human beings go through. In human terms, he became a slug out of love for us so that one day he could pay for our crimes and satisfy the justice that God required and make a way for us to return in our relationship with God. Now I know that doesn't sound very romantic and it sure doesn't sound very Christmassy, but that's the truth. That's why we celebrate Christmas, folks. For you see, just beyond the manger was the shadow of a cross. This is how the Apostle Paul describes why Jesus came and how he came. Who being Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
He did that out of love for us. Colossians 2.14 articulates what Christ accomplished on the cross. For everyone who puts their trust in him for forgiveness. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. In other words, he satisfied God's justice. He has taken it away. Nailing it to the cross. Friend, if you feel unworthy to come to God because you believe that God is disgusted with your sins and the way that you've lived your life and wants nothing to do with you, if you are thinking that way, the good news of the Christmas story is, is that Jesus came specifically to take your place and my place and he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross in our place so that we could stop nailing ourselves to the cross and be restored again in our relationship with God. Yes, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But because Jesus came, we have been forgiven. The price has been paid. The debt has been canceled. It is finished. We are free in Christ. The question is, have you embraced Christ? Have you embraced his forgiveness? See, the story of Christmas is a true story. But it will continue to be just a story to those who don't make it their own. God made a way through Jesus Christ for us to come in right relationship with him but so many people are just oblivious to the, gift, the free gift that he offers us. A few years ago, one of the greatest violin players, Joshua Bell, performed at a sold-out Boston Symphony Hall. The cheap seats sold for $100 each. Three days later, Joshua sat down against the wall next to a garbage container at the Washington, D.C. Metro wearing a t-shirt and jeans and a baseball cap. He removed his violin and, and then placing the open case of the violin in front of him, he shrewdly threw a few dollars in it and some pocket change just to serve as seed money. And then he began to play. For the next hour in the D.C. Metro, Bell, Bell played Mozart. He played Schubert. Thousands of people streamed by but most hardly noticed who was playing. If they'd paid attention, they might have recognized the young man for the world-renowned master violinist that he is. They might have noted that the violin that he was playing was a rare Stradivarius, well worth over $3 million. But hardly anyone noticed Bell received a total of $32 from the 27 people who stopped long enough to give a little donation. You know, in the same way, the masses were oblivious to this master violinist. So many people today are oblivious to the God of the universe who's trying to get their attention. But all through the scriptures, what we see is a God who refuses to give up, who continues to pursue us. In the words of 2 Chronicles 16, 9, like a lovesick father, God's on a mission, searching through the whole earth for those whose hearts are open to him. This is the grand theme of the Bible. It is the heart of of the Christmas story. God is passionately pursuing us. He's revealing himself in various ways. He's trying to get our attention. In Ezekiel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. In Luke 19.10, Jesus articulated why he came to earth. 
saying, for the Son of Man came to seek, to seek, to seek, and to save the lost. Now, some people react to the idea of being labeled as lost. To them, it's a sign of weakness and helplessness. But in this context, the word lost implies value. I mean, look at it this way. If you drop a nickel, nowadays most people won't even stop to pick it up. Lose $100, though, and you're going to search a little bit harder. But lose a child. And I don't need to tell you that you won't rest, you won't eat, you won't know the meaning of peace until that child is found. I'll never forget the time our family was vacationing in San Diego. We were walking on the pier by the ocean when suddenly our four-year-old son was gone. It was during that season when... uh, over the news we'd heard even before we went there that blonde blue-eyed kids were being were disappearing and all of a sudden our son was gone he was there one moment and the next he was gone panic and fear stole over us and as the minutes ticked by we, we began to shout his name at the top of our lungs we didn't care what other people thought All that mattered to us was finding our son. Five or so minutes later, in what seemed like an eternity, a couple emerged from the crowd that had gathered around us. And they came with our son in hand. I asked the couple how they found us, and they smiled and said, we heard you yelling his name a block away. And I share that story with you because just to help you to understand that God loves you like that. You matter to him. And he is calling your name. He is calling out to you. He's asking you to come back home. Are you aware that he's reaching out to you? Are you open to him? Are you responding to him? Even those of you who are Christians, are you aware that God is trying to get your attention? That he wants to talk to you on a regular basis? He wants to talk to you to encourage you to give direction for your life, but he also wants to talk to you to challenge you perhaps about an idol in your life or maybe about how you're neglecting your spouse and your family or maybe he wants to talk to you about how you're craving people's approval more than God's approval. Now the Bible teaches that one way that God tries to get our attention is through the beauty and majesty of his creation. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanses declaring the work of his hands. When you consider the vastness of the universe, when you think about the mathematical precision of the universe and our solar system, Is it any wonder why well over 95% of astronomers today believe in God? Because you see, they see the fingerprints of God all over the universe. The question is, has God gotten our attention through his creative power? Perhaps you received a wake-up call from God the day that your child was born. And you marveled at how wonderfully formed this little baby was, the image of two. As you reflected on the complexity of your child's DNA coding, the ten little fingers curled around yours, the incredible design of of your child's eyes made in 3D color and far more complex than any camera man will ever make, suddenly you were awakened 
to the creative power of God. Sometimes God tries to get our attention through the life of a genuine Christian. Down through the years, I've met countless people who for so many years had no time for God, no time for the church, figured everybody was a hypocrite. Until they met this certain genuine Christ follower whose life they just couldn't argue against. This Christ follower who was kind and gentle and joy-filled, lived a life of integrity and generosity, and in a sincere way talked about their relationship with Jesus as if they just had breakfast with him that morning. And God used that Christian to awaken them to his reality. And then sometimes God reveals himself to us directly. In the same way that he revealed himself to Mary and Joseph, to the shepherds in the Christmas story, even to the wise men. I've met many people who've had an encounter with God that was so real and so powerful. It not only awakened them to God's reality, but it changed the trajectory of their lives. We're hearing stories of thousands of people, many in other world religions, who are becoming followers of Jesus Christ after having a dream or a vision of Jesus. A few years ago, a, a young woman in our church told me her story of growing up in a Muslim home and ultimately marrying a Muslim man. One evening, she was overcome with anxiety about something, and out of nowhere, she sensed a voice clearly say to her, speak to Jesus. At that moment, she felt like a little child, and she had a powerful vision and a personal encounter with Jesus who appeared to her with his hands outstretched to her. She said to me, that encounter with Jesus was so real that I knew he is God. And she's been following him ever since, even at the cost of her husband leaving her and her children. Now, folks, these are just some of the ways God has or may be trying to get your attention. Perhaps for some of you, God got your attention through, just through reading the Bible that someone handed you during a very difficult and lonely season in your life. Perhaps God got your attention during the climax of Handel's Messiah as you were lost in the ecstasy of that incredible music. Maybe God put, got your attention through a sermon that you heard or a book that you read. Whatever it is, let me ask you, have you been listening? Have you been responding? A few years ago, a young man suffered a great loss. He became very angry with God, really didn't want much to do with him anymore. What he didn't know at the time was that God was pursuing him and was about to get his attention in a way that he couldn't resist or argue with. Watch this. I grew up in a Hindu family. My parents are the best people that I could ever have hoped and wished for. Uh, they're always kind, loving, caring. My dad, he is pretty much my hero. He was such a loving man. He, he cared about his family. He cared about his kids. In 2010, uh, his health started to deteriorate. He um, unfortunately got a call back from India. His niece had committed suicide. Over the course of the day, he, his, he couldn't handle it. My sister gives me a call and says, our father's passed away. And um, when I heard this from my sister, it just a sudden just weight in my heart and shock and anger and that whole year, I was just filled with anger and uh, just nightmare after nightmare. That just, just you wake up in sweat, 
right? It's just that real of nightmares of my dad coming back and then suddenly I realize that he's, didn't we just have a funeral for you? So later, towards the uh, end of the year, um, a friend invited me to church. Ever since I was 10, we would always have a uh, Easter special that comes on TV, and uh, the movie was ten, The Ten Commandments. And the first time I watched it, I, I, I loved it. And ever since then, I made it a, a point to watch it every single year, every single Easter, I would watch it on TV. I've always wanted to go to church service. So I, I decided to go. So after the service, I was supposed to connect with Pastor Ashwin. He also comes from my Hindu background, and uh, I felt he could relate to what I'm going through and where I come from. Uh, I just went to ask him some questions, and we talked about suffering and my father and um, uh, why God would allow something like this. He didn't try to explain why my, God, uh, my dad was taken away. What he did was he tried to point me towards God and what Christ is really like and explain his character, right? And I don't think any man or woman can explain to you why someone is taken away, right? But he can or she can explain to you about God and what he is really like. He challenged me to read my Bible. I was given a KJV version. The reason that I really like the KJV version with the, with the translation was because, again, of the Ten Commandments movie. Right? I really relate with that language and I really liked it. So I, I started reading Luke and I started attending church service in January. Every week I would have a question that I'm thinking about in my mind, something that I'm really struggling with. When I went to my first, first service, the answer to my question was the main topic in that sermon. I thought it was a coincidence, you know, like, you're supposed to get something out of church service and you're supposed to relate to it. And uh, I didn't really think much of it. And it kept continuing to happen. Uh, a second week, a third week. And then I was thinking it was too much of a coincidence. And so I, like, I personally like proofs. So I decided to not tell anybody around me, not tell any of my friends, not tell anybody that I'm speaking to at church because I was thinking, okay, maybe somebody that I know is telling the pastor, giving the sermon that, you know, uh, this is what you used to speak on, so maybe we, we can convert Varun, right? And uh, very, I was very skeptical, and uh, it continued to happen, and continued to happen from January till end of March. At the end of that, I, I really started to feel that God was, uh, He's trying to enter my life. He's trying to say, hey, Varun, like, I'm not distant. I don't, I'm not evil and, or manipulative or uncaring. Look, I'm trying to answer you week after week. I do care. I really started to feel his love. And I was, I, there's so many changes that I was experiencing inside in, in terms of who I am and valued. And in terms of helping or serving people, I, God's really started to change me, right, for the better. And uh, that's in March, that's end of March, that's when I really accepted Christ as my, uh, my, my Lord, my Savior. I had questions throughout the months, but um, with understanding, I really chose Jesus as my Savior. God has been changing my heart. That change of heart that He put in me was just so affirming. And I knew that this is the kind of life that I want, a life of serving people. Over the years, I felt like uh, this change has been constant and I'm constantly growing in love for people. And I'm excited to see what the future holds for me and what he's gonna bring into my life. And it might totally blindside me, which is awesome because I'll, I'm sure uh, what he has in store for me is the best and the best plan for me. My name is Varun and God pursued me. Yes, God pursued Varun, and one of the ways he got his attention was uh, through services like this, through the teaching of Scripture. I was teaching through the Sermon on the Mount series at that time, and I didn't know Varun at all. And I can honestly say I had no idea that God was using what I was teaching from the Bible every week to answer the specific questions that Varun was wrestling with. And, and, and neither did the other pastors who spoke occasionally during that three-month period of time. 
I think if we had known that, we would have messed it up royally. (laughs) You see, God was pursuing him, revealing himself to him in a very powerful way. Now, as we wrap up, I I want you to look at what Romans 1.20 says. It's on the screen in front of you. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. What that passage is saying, what that verse is saying is that deep down inside, we know there's a God. Oh, we may ignore him. We may try to explain him away, but deep down inside, that passage is saying that every person knows there's a God. It goes on to say, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. What that verse is implying is that there is coming a day when we will stand before God to give an account of our lives. And he is going to play back all the times he tried to get our attention. And if we ignored them, we will be without excuse. He's going to say things like, I tried to get your attention every time you drove by a cemetery or read the obituary column in the newspaper. I sent you a wake-up call on September 11th. I tried to get your attention the time that your chest tightened up and you had a hard time breathing and you ended up in emergency in the hospital. I sent you a wake-up call the time your daughter collapsed at school and nearly died. But you were too preoccupied. You were too self-assured. You were too proud, too concerned about what your family or your friends might think if you were to accept the free gift of grace and forgiveness that I was offering you through Jesus Christ. Friend, Jesus came to earth to make a way possible for us to be at peace with God and in right relationship with Him. He died on a cruel cross to make it possible, but He rose again. He is alive. And He's right here now. And he's speaking to some of you right now. He's right here waiting for you to respond to his invitation. To receive his free gift of grace and forgiveness. And to trust him with your life. Some of you have this emptiness. You have this ache inside of you. That you've been trying to fill with everything and everyone but God. For too long you've said no to God. And you've said yes to everyone and everything else that you thought would fill that void. And it has been years. And if you're honest, you know that emptiness, that ache remains. That sense of meaninglessness, the lack of satisfaction remains. I'm going to close with a prayer not unlike the one I prayed many years ago that changed my heart and the trajectory of my life forever. If you would like to become a friend and a follower of Jesus Christ, this incredible Jesus who left the splendor and the glory of the Godhead, if you want to experience his peace, and live the life that God intended for you to live, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer along with me. By the way, God knows your thoughts. You don't need to pray out loud. The important thing is, is that you pray sincerely from the heart because he hears you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and pursuing me. I admit, Lord, that I have a heart problem that's messing up my relationship with you and others. And I acknowledge that I can't fix this myself. I need you. I need a Savior. Thank you for sending Jesus, Father. Thank you for the price you paid to die for my sins. 
for the opportunity to be forgiven and for the power, the resurrection power that you give us, Lord, to live victoriously. Please forgive me for my sins, my selfishness. And I ask, oh God, that you would come into my life, that you would change my heart. You'd make me into the person that you created me to be. Guide me, Lord. Use my life in whatever way you want to bring hope where there is despair, love where there is apathy, and peace where there is turmoil. I love you, Lord. I trust you. And I intend to follow you wherever it is that you lead. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you sincerely prayed that prayer from the heart, the Bible says that in the spiritual realm, something incredibly dramatic has happened. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is, is that because you asked the Lord to do this, your sins, your regrets have been transferred onto Jesus' account. And his perfect righteousness has been transferred to your account. Because you act, asked him, he's invaded your life. And he is one with you. And you are now one with him. The old is gone. The new has come. And as you leave here today, I just want to encourage you to let someone know about your faith decision if you prayed that prayer. Let the person that you came with know. Let me know. Let someone know. On behalf of everyone here at Center Street, we do wish you a Merry Christmas and God's very best, His very best for you all this, Chris, uh, this coming year. Um, and now just take the blessing of the Lord with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.